Welcome to the Freedom Project podcast. The Freedom Project exists to make freedom in Christ known to each and every person we can reach and to encourage and dialogue with those who have already found freedom in Christ. Your host is Joe Weaver. Hello friends, welcome to the Freedom Project. My name is Joe Weaver, so happy you guys could come and join us today. Uh, You know, we're going to have a bit of a special event day today. We uh, have a conversation. I'm joined with uh, my good friend, pastor of the Vanier Bikers Church, Rob McKee, and uh, Charles Scheffler from Beth Ariel. Thanks so much for uh, coming in. Guys, I wanted to sit down today and uh, talk a little bit about how we see our positioning with the Lord and uh, with the the state of Israel and with the biblical Israel. Uh, The modern state of Israel from 1948 was uh, founded in the land of Palestine. It's often equated with the uh, Israel of the Bible. But there's a lot of difference between the secular Israel and, and the covenant Israel that we are kind of grafted into through our belief in the Lord. And I wanted to explore that a bit today because there's so many people in the church today and outside of the church, especially, who just seem to have a lot of varying notions on what's going on. Uh, I think it's a crucial time for us in the world right now uh, for lots of different reasons, biblically and certainly secularly. And I just wanted to ask you guys a few questions and, uh, and get your ideas on stuff that's going on in the world. Certainly between the three of us, we have a, a common belief in, in a, a salvation and a saving Jesus Christ, but we don't have the same beliefs perhaps as they relate to Israel and, and the world today. So I wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions and we'll have a conversation. You guys can go back and forth or if you have other questions arise out of questions, then we'll deal with them as they come up. Uh, so before we get going, why don't you just uh, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, okay, my name's Charles uh, Scheffler. Uh, I do lead a congregation here in Ottawa, a Messianic congregation. It's called Beth Ariel, Ottawa, which means House of the Lion of God. Uh, but I uh, have been saved since 2000. I grew up as a secular Jew, which I know is an oxymoron, because we wouldn't be Jewish without the Bible. But uh, I um, you know, sort of came to the end of myself in 2000 and originally found Jesus as a solution to an inner emptiness. Um, and I really was told at that time that if I became a believer in Jesus, I would no longer be Jewish. And ironically, when I went to church, they kind of told me the same thing. I had to stop living like a Jew, had to live like, you know, on a new calendar of holidays and so forth. And I've since found that that's really not true. You know, Jesus is Jewish. Disciples are Jewish. The, the faith is rooted in, uh, in all things Jewish. And uh, so I um, have, the Lord's brought me to a place today where that's what I do. And, and our mission is really twofold. One is we believe that a book written by Jews to Jews about a Jewish Messiah ought to be maybe reread and studied from a Jewish perspective. And number two, we want to bring the word of God to our Jewish people. Not just New Hadashah, the New Testament, but the Tanakh, their own word. Mm-hmm. And that's really our mission. Amen. Well, thanks for taking some time uh, for being here today. Rob, you know, lots of our viewers know a bit about you because yeah. uh, we're at your church, but give us a little bio. Yeah, well, my, uh, Rob, lead pastor at, at Bikers Church. I'm the Gentile, he's the Jew. <laughs> and, and so we thought we'd cover it from both perspectives here today. Um, and. You know what, we, we, we are a church that adamantly loves the word, and because of that, we understand the importance of Israel and have chosen to make a, a pretty bold stand uh, when it comes to uh, understanding God's covenants, understanding God's plan, and His purpose for a land and for people. Uh, so we've been very vocal about it. A lot of people, some like it, some don't like it, uh, but we're unwavering because I think when you read Uh, the Bible, you see it. Uh, it, It's amazing. It comes alive like never before, and you see God's heart and love for for the Jew, uh, for the land. Not that they're any better than us, and not that we put Israel on a pedestal and we worship uh, uh, the Jews, but it's understanding God is a covenant-keeping God, and He's got a plan. 
And, and we can't just kind of throw that away because we may not like what's happening over in a certain region of the world. Right. Um, and so it's, I think it's just we want people to have a great biblical worldview uh, when it comes to understanding not just Israel, but the signs of the times that we're living in. Yeah. And we are. I mean, we're living in uh, remarkably interesting times. So some of the I, I was going to throw some questions out, one or two. We'll see where we get. Uh, but these are questions I hear people asking, asking me. I hear them talking about them in coffee shops and on the streets. And I, and I, I see in their conversations there is a lot of misinformation there's a lot of uh, confusion and people are a bit uncertain where to land on certain issues so let's just get started with some questions and, and uh, you guys can flip a coin to see who wants to go first so this is a question here it says is it crucial to differentiate between the biblical Israel a covenant people of God and the modern state which was created through political means and is largely secular uh, and how so? How do we differentiate? First for the Jew, and then the Gentile. So I'll let you go first. Well, I would say that in my mindset, I see all things biblical. And I see that the establishment of the state of Israel was a miracle prophesied by Isaiah. Can a nation be created in a day? And um, Really, the first gathering of Israel in 1948, from a biblical point of view, was a gathering in disbelief. Whereas in the end times, in the tribulation, Israel will again be gathered from all four corners of the earth, and it will be a gathering of belief. So do we differentiate? Um, I, I think what we can say is that the people who are, when you call the covenant people of God, um, spiritual Israel, the way I look at it is that, you know, in Galatians 3.28, it talks about the seed, talks about the seed of Abraham. Well, I think there's some confusion. People, some people think that the spiritual seed of Israel, which includes the church in that sense, or those who believe in the seed, which is Jesus, have replaced the Jewish people. When in fact, uh, the seed, has a, there's a physical seed, there is a spiritual seed. And the physical seed is the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, marked by even today, physical circumcision by even secular Jews. Whereas the spiritual seed is uh, those who are in the seed of Messiah. So I'm kind of like a hybrid, right? And I think that hybrid notion of the physical, where the physical seed meets the spiritual, is I think symbolic of bringing these things together. And I'll just finish by saying that in sort of the westernized Greco-Roman mindset, and certainly within a lot of Christendom, we spiritualize everything away. And it, it becomes just a spiritual thing, whereas in Judaism, in Jewish thought, uh, everything is also physical. Even the word nefesh, which for soul, it, it encompasses everything. It encompasses the physical as well as the spiritual, which is why the Torah has so many commandments on where you should go and what you should eat and what you should wear and what you shouldn't do and so forth. So I think that, um, yes, I do understand that there's geopolitical, ethnic, national Israel, but I do see that the gathering of Israel, uh, A, uh, the Zionist movement was funded in large part by Christianity. Christians funded it in large part. And so I do see a spiritual significance in the gathering of what we would call national Israel. Okay, and, and the spiritual part of that, that's where we hear, read in our Bible, that we're grafted into the, the people of Israel as born-again Christians. Right. Yeah, and I think what's, what's notable about that is when it says in Romans 11, I believe it's verse... We have to look it up, but, it, but in Romans 11, either somewhere between 18 to 25, when it talks about that tree, it says, you know, it's a wonderful thing when the fullness of the Gentiles is saved, but how much more so when the Jews yeah. are grafted into yeah. their own tree, right? So the tree is rooted in, in Israel, and I mean, everybody's invited, but with all humility, yes, it's, it's their tree. I think we forget sometimes that, that when you read scripture, it was first for the Jew right. and then for the Gentile. Right. And so that, that hasn't changed. God's heart for his people has not changed. And I, I would fall probably along the same line as, as Charles when it comes to 
just having a good biblical understanding of Israel, whether it be biblical Israel or whether it be the state of Israel, I believe God has a plan for Israel and he is unfolding it and he is using whatever is necessary to see it come forth. And so we saw in 1948, in the month of May, where a nation was reborn. Was it birthed out of a secular movement and, and a Zionist movement? Yeah, we see that with Theodore Herzl, but we, we see all throughout scripture how God uses kind of people outside of a relationship with him, Nebuchadnezzar, how he used them to bring Israel to where they were at. So I think sometimes we forget that God is the one that is causing things to happen. And he's going to use the, the people and, and the places necessary to, to see that happen. When I look at people who throw that term Zionism around, well, you're just a Zionist. Well, I always tell them, I say, well, hold on a sec here. When I read scripture, if we look at what the heart of Zionism is and how it started was a desire for the Jews to have their own land, their home state. Uh, and when I read the scripture, that's God's heart. Because you go to Amos chapter 9, and he says, I will plant them in the land, never to uproot them again. So I tell them, well, God was the first Zionist, because he said he'll bring them back to the land, never to uproot them again. Uh, and that's just, that's not my opinion, that's the word of God. And, and I believe we started to see the fulfillment of that prophecy in 1948. <laughs> I was having coffee with a, a guy discussing some of this a couple weeks ago, and he said to me, oh, you're just a Christian Zionist. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> so, yeah, I am, yeah. One hundred percent, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a Zionist, and I believe that the, the Jews have a, have a land, that God's got a plan and a purpose for them. Right. And, and he's, he's unfolding it according to his timeline. So we see, having that knowledge, what you guys just brought to us, we see within the church, in the church age, uh, this kind of split in theologies. Yeah. So we have uh, this a covenant theology, uh, and it and we have a dispensationalism sort of theology within the church, and some people are, are either you know you're all covenant, you're all dispensational, uh, but I think that there's a, a an ability to mix those two theologies, and that we need to understand where those theologies come from. But again, in this time that we're living in where we seem to be unable to have healthy discourse. I see people just butting heads on this. Uh, and what are your thoughts? Rob, why don't you start on that yeah, one? Yeah, when it comes to covenant theology or just dispensationalism, um, I knew none, none of that. When I got saved, that was not on my radar. And as I began to read scripture, I kind of formulated, not from any influence of everyone, and and would lean more to side now the dispensationalism because I, I believe the Bible is literal. Like when, when they talk about things, when they talk about a thousand year reign, I believe it's a thousand year reign. I don't believe that's metaphorically. So I believe that. Uh, I think it goes back to a bigger argument that the, the debate that's been going for a long time uh, is Calvinism versus Arminianism because I think that's where it's rooted in. And I think all of us would go out on a, or couldn't deny that in some way, shape or form that we might be a two-point Calvinist, a three-point Calvinist, because we agree with some of those things, but we don't agree with all of those things. So, yeah, I think you can kind of have one foot in each one of those, those camps, but it's understanding before there was covenant theology, before there was dispensationalism, there was the Word of God, and it's true. And when I read that, I kind of look at what the Word is saying, not based on this belief that, that whether Darby came up with it or whether it was Spurgeon or whether it was birthed out of this. I'm thinking, no, no, I'm going to do my best to decipher the Word of God and, and see what it's saying. And so I, I think you can kind of have one foot in, in both worlds. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So covenant theology, from a Jewish perspective, is based on the... Mosaic and Abraham uh, covenants that carry over into the New Testament. Is that good? Well, actually, what I, I think even more so is understanding covenant theology from, from there is actually three covenants. So it's the covenant of works, it's the covenant of grace, and it's the covenant of redemption. So those, it's not even talking about biblical covenants. It's talking about those three things. And so that's why I say it has to be rooted in God's word. And so when you look at the covenant of works, the covenant of, of grace and the covenant of redemption, that is the fundamental lens that the covenant theologies uh, people are going to look through. 
Um, they're not going to look at the actual biblical covenants. They're going to look at it through, hey, well, there's this covenant, this, this, and this. So uh, I think that's just help give your viewers a, a little bit of an understanding of what, what covenant what theology is. is. Well, I think the, the difference for me uh, when I uh, was, if I look at covenant, uh, the way you talked about it, of grace, redemption, and works, well, obviously, uh, we understand the difference, works, grace, redemption. However, the biggest uh, thing I think that makes the two incompatible for me is the idea that all of the covenants and all of the promises that God made to Israel are fulfilled yeah. in the church. To me, that is, is not biblical. And the reason that it's not biblical is because, well, first of all, if we look at the nature of a promise, right, um, in order to vindicate a promise, the contents of the promise must be order, honored and the person to whom the promise must be kept. So as an example, if I have two kids and I promise kid A a bicycle, but by the end of the summer, kid A was naughty, and so I give the bicycle to kid B, have I kept my promise? And the answer is clearly no, because I promised it to kid A, right? So until kid A gets his uh, bicycle, that promise has not been fulfilled. So when we look at the promises to Israel, which are all embedded within the Abrahamic covenant, uh, to me, Abra the Abrahamic covenant is, let's say, the foundation of yeah. all the end times stuff. The capstone is the restoration of Israel. And the restoration of Israel is where all of the promises come together. So the covenant of Abraham, uh, the borders that were originally, as you say, yeah. literally promised mm -hmm. to Abraham yeah. in 12 and 15, that will be honored, and it's actually a giant square, much bigger than what you see now on the map. Uh, the Davidic covenant will be honored because the Jewish Messiah will return to Jerusalem and sit on the throne of David. And the land covenant will be honored because all the people will be gathered back into the land. And the new covenant uh, people think that it's fulfilled in the time of Christ. Well, the fact is, it's a Jewish covenant. In Jeremiah 31, it says, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, right? So what that means is that it was ratified upon the death of Messiah, but it will be fulfilled when the Jewish people are given a new heart and they see their own Messiah. So we see the actual fulfillment of these four promises within scripture. And to me, uh, that is very, very, very important. And so that to me is incompatible with covenant theology, which claims that promises have all, the promises to Israel have all been fulfilled to the church. Within the church. Within the church. I think the word they use today is replacement theology, that the church has, has replaced Israel. And I don't find that anywhere in my scripture. I really don't. I looked. Yeah, I, I looked. I I've been I looking for it. Really I haven't found it, by I, the way. Am I missing it? Yeah. Am I really missing it here? Am yeah. I that far off? And I don't see it anywhere. And by the way, the verse I referred to before was 1124. It says, for if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. Right. That's Romans 11, verse 24. And then in, yeah, and in Revelation, uh, John's told to, to write, all you have seen, all that has been, and all that will come. Right. Yeah. So these covenants right. are Yes, yeah. one, I think that's 119, yes. exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, the, and, and Revelation, that's a great way that you point out to understand the book of Revelation. Like, you know, but, the, the but past, you can't the start with future. Revelation. I have lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> you can't read the end of the yeah. book and, and not understand yeah. the rest of the book because yeah. then it makes no yeah. sense. Rocky 11 yeah. yeah. Make yeah. Sense. yeah. It makes, it it makes no sense. Yeah. And, and you made an interesting point when we were talking earlier about how much of the New Testament is actually taken from the Old yeah, Testament. Yeah, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of, you've heard of this, this I, I won't mention names, but believers now need to unhitch themselves from the Old Testament. And I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. How can you do that? <laughs> 855 times in the New Testament, the Old Testament is quoted. And so when you look at a percentage, that means 27% of the New Testament is Old Testament. And so how do we say we unhitch ourselves 
from, if God's a covenant-keeping God, from covenants that have yet still to be fulfilled, that we're seeing f unfold before our very eyes. And you'd be unhitching yourself from the Bible yeah. that Yeshua read and taught from along with Paul. So it doesn't make much sense. So we don't, uh, and just for, for me, I, I haven't had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interaction with Messianic Jewish church. Um, so in regards to, I mean, I know for me as a Christian, I can't put more weight on the Old Testament or the New Testament. The New Testament gives me my hope for eternity, but it all comes out of the Old Testament. But from a Jewish perspective, is there a greater importance looking at the Old Testament and being a born again Christian? You know, the Bible is divinely inspired, mm. but there is one man-made page in the Bible, not God-made. And it's the one page that separates the Old and the New Testament. Yeah. If you rip that out of your Bible, now it becomes one book. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right, let's move on to a different question here. Um, we may have talked about this a bit, but the terms Zionism and Judaism are often interchanged. Zionism is a secular movement. Judaism is a religious movement. So how do you re reconcile the two biblically for people today who, um, who, who they, they put the whole Ju movement of Judaism in, lump it in with Zionism, and, and lots of people see that as two separate things. Well, there is a separation because uh, if you put two Jews in a room, you're going to get three opinions. <laughs> so uh, Zionism is a return to Israel, whereas uh, many in Judaism, especially on the far, far right in Israel, are very much against yes. the Zionist movement because right. they say that man's doing it. It's not God scattering, you know, bringing back the scattered Jews into the land, uh, almost as miraculously scripture talks about, as if it was creation itself. Um, however, obviously, again, I see everything biblical. So I see, I wouldn't say that Z Judaism is a part of Zionism. It's sort of like all, all thumbs are fingers, but not all fingers are thumbs, right? So I think that it's really the other way around. I think that within Judaism, you have a very wide spectrum of beliefs ranging from very, very liberal and reform uh, to ultra, ultra right-wing orthodox. And within those, that spectrum of beliefs and messianic, of course, being in there, there's a wide variety of, of opinions on that. Um, but I think overwhelmingly, the, the majority of Jewish people are, I would say, pro-Zionistic. They want to see uh, the state of Israel uh, survive and be together. And obviously, it was created out of the Jewish people needing, a home, needing their homeland after you know, a third of our people were decimated during the Holocaust. We had nowhere to go. And one thing that I often hear in Israel, which, which does move me, is, look, they say, we don't have another country to go to, right? Um, and so that is the only place where it's, ironically, even though it sounds unsafe, it's probably the safest place in the world for a Jew to be. Um, so uh, I think those are my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and you kind of, you kind of uh, articulated what I was trying to say a bit better there because I hear people interchanging those two terms and it's not really a correct... No, Ju Judaism is the, the religion of the Jewish people, which is, by the way, rooted more in the Talmud, which is where Messianic Judaism uh, is not... Well, there's Messianic Judaism, but then there's just Messianic faith. And Messianic faith, which is what I am more of, although I respect the rabbis and the sages, I do not come under the authority of rabbis. I come under the authority of God. So we are not really part of the Jewish religion. Judaism is the Jewish, typical Jewish religion. And Zionism, of course, is the movement of uh, Jews back to Israel. Jews back Correct. to Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts, Rob? Uh, I, I think Charles articulated it very well there. Um, I would say the, the bigger picture, we've seen so many different kind of branches of Zionism come out of, I think, what the original intent was, was the Jews to have their homeland. And now you see political Zionism, educational Zionism, it's getting its tentacles into everything. And again, bringing a, I, I, I think, a, a great misunderstanding to 
the scriptures and to God's heart. And we can never forget it's about God's heart. It's about his plan. It's about his purposes for, for a people and for a land, for a covenant that was spoken all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 and 15. And we can never forget that. So I, again, I stand on the thing that Zionism at the, the simplest form is the, the Jews having their own homeland and God was the first Zionist because he's the one that spoke it and said it was going to happen. And we are the ones that are getting to see it unfold before our very eyes. So we talked about how, how uh, we're grafted into the tree of Israel uh, and we become the church with Israel through that. That's the, and we have a saving hope through Jesus Christ for eternity. But how do we reconcile those beliefs in the, particularly where uh, the, the position that we're in politically in the world today, um, every time I try to speak about this with someone, even family members, they're so vehemently against Israel that it's almost impossible for us to have this kind of healthy discourse. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, um, is, is that, that the hatred we're seeing towards Israel based on uh, political events, or is it really based on some of the stuff from the Bible where it tells us that, you know, you will be hated among the nations? I think nothing has changed when I read scripture. There's always been a desire to see Israel wiped out. Yeah, to for see sure. The, to see from, the right in 1949, so, I think seeing, was it? The Annihilation yeah, again, War. <laughs> I think we're just seeing scripture fulfilled before our very eyes. Yeah. Um, and it, it's gut-wrenching. It is really gut-wrenching to watch what, what, what is unfolding. And, and I know for us as a church, is we've made the point to say, hey, listen, we're, we're going to stand with Israel. And death threats and, and attacks and, and, and people saying, calling us a, a nest of Nazis and to burn them out and wanting to burn down the church. I'm thinking, whoa, 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 guys, you are missing it here. And I think, again, it comes down to a misunderstanding. It comes down to a narrative, I believe, that is being fed to us. That's a one-sided narrative that we see on mainstream media. Um, because the enemy hates whatever God loves. And he's going to do whatever he can. And God loves Israel. So guess who hates it? The enemy. So there's a bigger thing taking place and, uh, that we don't get to see in the natural realm. We used to get to see the evidence of what's happening in the spiritual realm being fleshed out in the natural realm. And I think that's just a reality that we're seeing a, a, an all-out attack for thousands of years against Israel and yes. a desire to see them eliminated. And this is not this is a new thing no, in 1948 and then the 1967 war and the five wars that have <laughs> taken place um, in, in, in our lifetime. But uh, no, it's, it's bigger. It's a, it's a huge spiritual battle. Yeah, and I, I think it's... Uh... As we were talking a bit earlier about, I mean, we, it, we see it, we're living it in real time now because we see it instantly uh, with what's happening in social media. But it's causing some division uh, that's that just Nobody incredible. It's been an ongoing struggle. Nobody likes the war. But I mean, even within my own family, I've got children and grandchildren who, who are angry because I stand for Israel. And, uh, I'm wondering if, if Charles, maybe part of that isn't because as a church, we haven't visibly and vocally stood for Israel for a long time. You know, we, we haven't made that known. What are your thoughts about that? My, my thoughts are, first of all, I, I second what Rob said, which is that the real enemy behind all of this is Satan. Amen. This is, he knows that God's plan ends in his demise. Yeah. And the only way he can stave off his own demise is to thwart God's plan for Israel because the word, salvation, the Messiah, came through the Jews and again will come through the Jewish Messiah in the end of times. Um, and anti-Semitism is as old as the hills, I mean, since the Jews were a nation. Uh, we always joke at every um, Jewish holiday. We begin by saying, they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. And, but I think where, in all, in all um, humility, I would say, you know, I really, really understand the, the, how grief-stricken uh, people are over the loss of, of life uh, that this war has taken. 
I'm, all, I'm kind of curious, though, as to, it's amazing how um, Israel and the civilian toll is so focused on, yet in Yemen, Afghanistan, and Sudan, millions of children are affected, thousands are dying, and we don't even, in silence, we don't even hear about it on the news. Um, you talked about the creation of Israel as a state. Let's remember that the Jews and Arabs have been in that lot of the world for a long time, coexisting. And Israel has always been trying to live at peace with its neighbors. And, and to assimilate. And to assimilate. Yeah. And in, in 1947, when a two-state solution was proposed, Israel accepted it. Yeah. They said, sure, fine, let's do that. Uh, it was the Arabs that said no. Yeah. And um, today, uh, you do have two million Arabs living within Israel proper, and they're not living in tents as Bedouins. They're occupying positions on the Supreme Court, uh, surgeons in hospitals, uh, in the Knesset, on the police force, uh, fully integrated into um, their society. So I think that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation, and it's all fueling one of the most awful phenomenon that we see in the world, which is anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. which is now at its all-time high since the Nazi regime. So if people think that, for instance, I woke up today to hear that Israel uh, bombed a building in Gaza, which collapsed, and 90 people were killed, 25 of whom were kids. So I hear something like that, and I get teary. Now, uh, Israel is saying that, first of all, they have for weeks been telling people to evacuate that area. Number two, there was a Hamas gunman on the roof of that building, which they tried to take out, not knowing that the entire building would collapse, and thinking that there was nobody in that building. So let me tell you, I don't think there's a nation on earth or a people on earth that values life any less uh, any, uh, any, you know, any, any more or rather than, than Israel, uh, the, the likes of which you've never seen. And they go, they go to all lengths, I mean almost what I would say is military lunacy and how they forewarn what they're going to do and where no they're going to do it. No one else does that. And you have uh, the enemy, uh, Hamas, which is when they find out where they're going to be attacked, they shuttle all kinds of innocent life and kids into that area so that they can fuel this idea of anti-Semitism. Propaganda machine. So let me tell you, I pray for Gazans. Yeah. I pray I for Palestinians. I pray for Arabs. I pray for the nations. Uh, because the blessing of Abraham is for all families of the earth. Yeah. And we value every life, all life. And I think that's one of the problems. We're up against an enemy that does not that when you die, your family gets money, you get honored, you're a martyr, and it's celebrated, and you get to go and be with virgins in heaven. So we're dealing with an enemy that doesn't care if it dies. And, and, and I know I'm generalizing in saying that. It's a generalization, and it could be criticized, but there is, a, there is that, that, that strain of thought. So I think when we say that we're for Israel, um, we're not, we, we are not not for innocent life. We value life. Right. War is a messy business. Uh, we want it to be over. We want our hostages to be home. But split screen, split screen. Here you have a building that collapsed. Israel freaked out. You know, very sorry that there were people in that building uh, coming right on uh, addressing that situation versus six hostages about to be recovered who were shot in the back of the head yeah. on purpose, right? Split screen. So what we're dealing with here is a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, Jews are accused of committing genocide. And I think the people that say that do not know what the definition of genocide is. Genocide is going after uh, trying to eliminate, eradicate an entire race or ethnic group of people. And there's only one side that has that written into their charter, and it's Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, they, they not only want to obliterate Israel, they want to, they want to take out every Jew on the planet. 
and it's very sad. Well, that's been, it's, it's uh, interesting to hear your perspective on that. In fact, the, I think the first war that they had in the region with the Arabs attack, I think they call that the War of Annihilation. Uh, so yeah, that's always been a case. And I think there's, right. And I think there's, been, there's a consensus that Israel has a right to defend itself pretty much around the world, but we have this uh, issue where um, these innocents are being killed, and, and all of us feel that deep in our hearts, all of us do. and yeah, we wish it's that was. It's yeah. So our hope and our desire is that we all come to an understanding of Jesus, and that's as you were saying, that's for everyone. Our, the Word of God tells Arabs us. Arabs need Jesus. Yeah. Muslims, Muslims need, Jesus. need Jesus. Jews need Jesus. Right. Palestinians need Jesus. Yeah. Iranians need Jesus. The Lebanese need Jesus. Amen. The Syrians need Jesus. The Jordanians need Jesus. need Jesus. And and the scripture tells us that his desire is that none should perish. Yeah. So right. so we have to go through these things as they're laid out in yeah. the Word of God and Revelation. And our hope is that all of these people are going to come to an understanding. But we're also walking through this world guided by our moral and ethical standards that we get from the Word from of God. The Bible. You know, they come down from through the, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic covenants. They teach us, teach us how to live yeah. socially and uh, politically and, and uh, legally with each other. And, uh, you know, Jesus taught us that we're to love, to, to be of service, to pick up the oppressed. And, and I think part of the situation in the world, certainly in the public eye, and even in the Christian church, we feel that we're not walking in that love. Lots of people I, when I, that I talk to say, how can this be happening if you're in a loving uh, relationship with Jesus? And uh, how can you support Israel? So I'm wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know, uh, I've never seen, and I'm almost, I'll be 70 soon, and I've never seen this kind of uh, division amongst people in and out of the church. And uh, I'm wondering if, if this is, if, if we can look at it completely biblically, or we look, you know, in Thess Second Thessalonians tells us there will be a spirit of delusion that may come on the world. Are we living in that spirit of delusion with people now who only see one side of this issue from either side? <laughs> or is it Matthew when he says that, uh, you know, the Jews will be hated among the nations? What are your thoughts on where we are today and how we can maybe reconcile uh, with people who can't get their heads around the massive loss of life that's going on in the area? But God. Uh, it, it's, it's a but God moment. Uh, when I, again, I tie everything back to the scriptures. And when I look at what is happening in Israel and having the opportunity, not just kind of looking at it from afar, but actually being in the land actually going into the West Bank. I've been to the West Bank. I know what it's like to walk into the West Bank where you see signs that are erected there and said, uh, Israeli citizens not welcome. Entering is dangerous for your life. But Charles alluded to it like in 1947, the desire for a two-state solution, and they turned it down. Then they turned down four other mm -hmm. desires for a same uh, a two-state solution. And uh, so when you're surrounded by nations that don't believe you should exist, there's always tension and, and, you, and you can feel it. And I think the Jews have done a very good job and we forget that they're blinded to Christ. And so the world, are they trying to hold the Jews to this standard? Well, what would Jesus do? They've rejected Jesus. And, and, and we know that's going to keep going until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, as we see the scripture. Then the veil is going to be lifted. But I think the beautiful thing that's happening is we're starting to see that, that there are Messianic believers now by the thousands that are starting to uh, have their eyes open and their hearts unveiled to who uh, Jesus is. He's the true Messiah. And they're starting to see that. Uh, we don't get that here. That's not the narrative that's being fed to us, that we are always saying this is wrong. We're holding Israel to this standard. I find it interesting that Israel is the only nation, you look at in the UN, that is held to this incredible standard. No other nation is, is held to it. That, that Iran last week brought, and brought, brought forward. Yeah. <laughs> that's absurd. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, wow, it is crazy. But again, it's not surprising because it's all in Scripture. 
All of it is unfolding the way God's intending it to unfold. And, and I think his heart is broken. His heart is broken. So I know for us as a church, if you follow us, our morning devotions, we end our morning devotions praying the only good, the only good that is going to come from this is hearts that are going to turn to Jesus. Amen. It's Jewish hearts that are going to turn to Jesus, that are Arab hearts and Palestinian hearts. And we pray for the innocent that are caught in a vicious war because of Hamas, because of Hezbollah, because of the Iranian regime. Um, and and we, we, we pray deeply and and our concern for the loss of every innocent life. Hmm. It's brutal. It is brutal. Charles, you got any uh, thoughts on how we end this with a positive note? Sure. I think that just as the Mosaic Law showed us that we cannot attain holiness on our own, all of this is showing us that we can't attain yeah. peace on our own. Nope. Yeah. The only peacemaker is the Prince of Shalom, the Prince of Yeshua. Somebody said to me the other day, what does all this have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? We're in the dispensation of grace. This political military stuff has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my response back was, okay, do you think any of this has anything to do with the Bible in general? And I believe that the people that are, are kind of on the fence within Christendom that don't know where Israel or what vital role Israel plays in the plan of God, uh, I think many of them aren't reading their Bibles. Yeah. I think as soon as you open the scriptures, you'll see that about 80% of the Bible deals with Israel directly or indirectly. Uh, a quarter of the Bible deals with prophecy. Um, and basically, you know, this is a story where we see God's faithfulness to his people. Um, and, and, and ultimately, uh, yeah, Yeshua is the only peacemaker, the only solution, permanent lasting solution to anti-Semitism and all of these discussions is when the Messiah returns. Amen. So as we say, yeah. Mashiach now, Mashiach now. Yes. And that's the most positive yeah. note I think we can end on. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, I want to thank you guys for taking the time. I know you're both really busy. Uh, it's an important topic, and I yes. hope that we uh, are able to, to bring some information into the people out there and maybe uh, change some hearts. And again, our message is get into your Bible. Get into your Bible. Dive get in and uh, find out what God Correct. says about everything that's going on. So thanks for taking the time. Yeah. I want to thank you guys for uh, tuning in again to the Freedom Project. Uh, you know, we uh, love to hear from you, so send us your comments, share and like uh, our programs. And if you have any questions about what you heard today, please uh, let us know. We'll put up the information of both these gentlemen on the sure. uh, site so that uh, you can call them directly or send them emails, or you can send in comments and we'll get back to you. And we just want to also encourage you to uh, you know, sometimes in this world, we don't feel like we as individuals can make a difference, but prayer makes all the difference in the world. So we just ask you from uh, the bottom of our hearts here to pray for the situation in the Middle East and pray for the people all around the world who still need to come to an understanding of what it means to be free in Christ, because that is the thing that will make a difference in this world. So thanks for tuning in. Remember our scripture here at the Freedom Project, John 8:36. If the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. God bless you, and we'll see you all next time for an episode of The Freedom Project. <laughs>